Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. So today's going to be the first of many discussions about tribal broadband. My name is Christine Firethunder. I'm the Governor's Policy Advisor in Tribal Relations and also the Director on Tribal Relations. And also joining us today is Jeff Chabaka from the Arizona Commerce Authority. Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, Christine. I'm Jeff Sabaka. I'm the State Broadband Director for the State of Arizona. Great. So do we have Mr. Leiser joining us today? Vice President Leiser, are you with us? He is okay. not on at the moment. Okay, well, let's just give him a few minutes then. So first, let's just talk about what, what we have planned for today. First, we're gonna have uh, Mr. Leiser come on and do our invocation. And after that, we'll have Adam Geiser do an overview of the resources that are available to the tri Tribal Broadband Connectivity Grant. I wanna emphasize that today's event is largely centered around your participation. So if you could please contribute as much as you would like to the Q&A portions, we really wanna devote as much time and energy as we can to answering some of your questions and about how you may wish to utilize these resources for implementation of broadband in your communities. After that, we're gonna have a quick stretch break and followed with a panel by some of my esteemed colleagues. And what we've done here is after we've had the overview of the um, financial portion of the event, we'll talk about some of the other entities throughout the state who have a wide range of broadband in their communities. Some are very advanced and some, you know, some don't even have a tribal library yet. So we want to give as much diverse opportunities for you to see how you could leverage these things in your own areas. And then after that, we'll go through more funding resources and followed up with a legislative update. Okay. Brad, do we have Mr. Leiser? Yes, I am here. Good morning. Great, welcome, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, if you would please provide the invocation, it would be greatly appreciated. Oh, you betcha, you betcha. Um, are we, so we're live now, right? Yes, sir. All righty then, let's, uh, let's open up in uh, uh, prayer. So I appreciate the opportunity, thank you. Um, my Heavenly Father, we thank you, the great creator, a great spirit. You are known by many names, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We um, beseech you at this time, <clears throat> this time during a, a stressful time, time of hardship for our people all across the land, Lord, that you would see and have mercy and, and grace for the people all across the land. We pray for our tribal nations, Lord, that have uh, struggled with uh, uh, various uh, varying uh, in inequities over the history, Lord, and we know you love your people, Lord. You have set us here on this uh, continent for a reason. Our prayers are powerful, Lord. We pray for healing across the, the, the nation, the United States, North America, Turtle Island, Lord, and abroad, Lord, to the world, the globe, your, your creation. We, we honor you. And we, we pay homage to you. We ask for healing. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for uh, all these things, Lord Father, that will make our nation strong once again. And Lord, we ask again for your wisdom in which to do it. And as we bestow honor to you, Lord, we would pray for uh, a spirit that would love our own people, Lord, uh, that we would uh, work endlessly uh, to bring great change, to bring enhancement as leaders can often do, whether it's legislating or regulating or developing policies to enhance economic development. And, uh, uh, lessen the disparities in health care and education all across the land, Lord. We give this to you. The word says that we will be successful if we submit our plan to you. So, Lord, we know you care and you have mercy for your people. We ex ask that you extend that to us now. Give us your wisdom here in which to conduct this meeting to enhance the quality of and the capacity of broadband and internet Lord, for the people, God. Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Amen. Thank you so much, sir. Yes. Um, Myron, Vice, Myron Leiser is Vice President of the Navajo Nation. Um, in addition to being here today, Mr. Leiser, would you give us some insight into what is happening for broadband for the Navajo Nation? 
Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I am the Vice President of the Navajo Nation and uh, uh, let me introduce myself in my uh, traditional way here on the Navajo Nation. Uh, Vice President Liza Manchi Nation, Tol Hana Bashis Chin, Do Comanche Beshi Che, Glash Deshaneli. Uh, it's good to be with you all here, uh, convening on this meeting of the look to see what broadband uh, and enhancing broadband in the Indian country and for this particular time uh, on the Navajo Nation. Um, this pandemic really did, uh, um, it made it uh, very apparent and um, the need for broadband access. And so uh, as we, as leaders, we wish to be transparent in that. We wish to advocate for our people at the highest levels, uh, developing relationships, enhancing relationships, and using all of the resources and capacities that are at our disposal. Um, this um, collaboration with the states uh, is very important and integral in bringing enhanced uh, broadband to the um, Indian country and to the Navajo Nation. Um, but you also have to include the counties and even the cities, uh, even neighboring tribes who are essential uh, to close the digital divide gap that we have right now. <clears throat> An example is a, a partnership that we have with the Hopi to get Tuba City uh, connected with fiber uh, is a great example of that uh, uh, needed partnership. Um, Navajo has been awarded uh, funding for E-rate uh, in February for 90 chapters. Uh, as you know, the Navajo Nation is comprised of 110 chapters. And so 90 of those have been funded by the E-rate and have been approved and the remaining 20 are in the a process right now uh, of applying uh, for uh, additional, uh, I guess, uh, resources for that. Uh, developing smart and resilient tribal lands with the community um, um, broadband uh, uh, the, using federal funding programs. We appreciate all those. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we, we look to hope uh, to use uh, external funding, grant funding, and any and all funding really, program funding uh, that itself uh, has to be applied for. But other than that, we wish to collaborate with our federal families to receive uh, these, these monies. Um, and we know I mean, uh, there's nothing free, right? I mean, we get grants, we get all these things, but it does cost. And we also look to be uh, team players. We also look to see what, else, what we can contribute. And in any uh, negotiation, you know, uh, what is beneficial for more, a, more and more people is really uh, looked at uh, more strategically, more enhancing any deal, uh, any, any promise or proposal. So, uh, you know, with that, uh, we've been wanting to partner with the state of Arizona, Department of Transportation, uh, uh, signing, I guess, uh, um, up with uh, Governor Ducey's uh, proposal to uh, bring smart highways and enhance those in the state of Arizona. We advocate for our own uh, Highway 264 running east and west, and also Highway 191 that's running north-south, connecting Utah to southern Arizona. Uh, this is a tourism corridor. I think both of them are tourism corridors. Uh, it, it is a gateway to the Monument Valley, Canyon de Shea areas, but also deeper and uh, farther north into southern Utah Canyon lands, very beautiful area of tourism. Also uh, uh, to the Lake Powell region, uh, uh, this is uh, boats and whatnot, RVs traveling through the Navajo Nation. So we really see a great need to enhance their capability to continually be in touch, to have no dark or gray areas there. So uh, we look forward to working with the state of Arizona and uh, all of the entities that uh, would sign on and enlist to help bring this needed service to uh, Indian country. But we wish to continue discussion on enhancing current tribally owned broadband network. As you know, we do have our own, but uh, how can we partner and how can we um, um, I, I promote just a robust, a more robust offering in uh, um, broadband and in internet, uh, providing access to access, Im implementing for education and uh, first responders and tribal communities. We advocate for community and the outreach uh, for consultations during the COVID pandemic from the Arizona governor's office, even extending uh, Governor Ducey to come visit Navajo. You know, I know he's uh, got uh, uh, several, about 15 months or so, I, I can't remember the, uh, the time, uh, but you know, Governor Ducey is always welcome to come to Navajo Nation. Uh, I think it's time to, uh, to bring him out here and to uh, help us advocate for um, uh, all the broadband can be here uh, in, on the Navajo Nation. 
as you know, uh, we do have uh, neighbors that, that we kind of surround, which is our Hopi brothers and sisters, and also the San Juan Southern Paiutes there. Uh, so uh, when you come to see Navo, you come to see three nations, very, very strong and resilient nations at that. Uh, we're, uh, we look to leverage broadband infrastructure to strengthen tribal sovereignty. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we really need to focus on. Uh, the future of tribal broadband and uh, the cyber infrastructure. Uh, you know, through this pandemic, we've seen a great need to have the telehealth capacity just expanded uh, at the, the greatest rate. Uh, urgency is very, very uh, much uh, in, in charge here. Uh, we have the great need to expand those capacities telehealth, that's the future, that's the next horizon here or the next frontier for broadband and for internet here. Uh, Education-wise, uh, who would have thought we'd have our students all stuck at home, isolated, uh, needing to keep up with their studies. So uh, we fear that a lot of our students have, may have been left behind uh, struggling. Uh, hopefully their grades have been maintained, kept intact uh, for those that are graduating and going on to our state's finest universities and colleges, uh, but enhancing broadband on the Navajo Nation uh, makes for a strong Northeast Arizona, makes for a strong Northern Arizona and to uh, tout Governor Ducey's own words to develop Arizona into a stronger economy, to return back to our glory days pre-pandemic. And uh, I think helping Northeastern, i.e. the Navajo Nation and Northern Arizona makes for a whole stronger, robust Arizona. And so that's what we wish for. That's what we advocate for. So at this time, I'd just like to, uh, you know, I guess advocate again for uh, smart highways to be included in that great package there that'll bring smart highways to Highway high, uh, 191, the North-South Corridor, and also 264, the East-West Corridor. And again, making for a stronger uh, uh, Arizona unified and, and strengthened economically uh, we're able to just bring more stores, more uh, ability to uh, bring uh, infrastructure, maybe even new manufacturing and uh, uh, um, new industries coming to this area. We have the workforce, they're skilled at that, and we do have the need to bring jobs because we're losing our coal-fired power plants, five of them in our region. And, um, you know, uh, again, uh, I probably sound like I'm campaigning, but <laughs> campaigning for broadband and internet here on the Navajo Nation. So with that, I think I'd like to just uh, uh, look for any and all opportunities to partner with all of our 22 other tribes here in, uh, in, in Arizona. So I want to thank you, Christine uh, Fire Thunder, for hosting this and uh, make sure that uh, Governor Ducey knows that he's much welcome to come up and We'll take them on a personal tour. And uh, I feel too, it's kind of needed for leaders. Uh, even we face that uh, reality here, needing to uh, take a peek into all 110 chapters because by and large, you know, we're only uh, able to focus on a few things at a time. When we don't go out there, it's out of sight, out of mind, and uh, we don't wish to leave no one behind. So yeah, I appreciate this opportunity. Great, thank you so much for your kind words, Mr. Weiser. Okay, so next what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce Adam Geisler from the National Tribal Government, uh, as, I'm sorry, he serves as a National Tribal Government Liaison. Adam, Adam will be here to provide us the NTIA overview and also the grant overview. Great. Uh, Christine, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, sir. Wonderful. And uh, Vice President Leiser, good to see you again. Thank you so much for the opening prayer and those uh, really thoughtful comments around the needs that Indian country is facing from Navajo's perspective. But uh, I think you you hit home on a lot of the issues that most of Indian country are facing today as a result of this pandemic. So wise words as always, and it's always good to see you again. Um, uh, um, good morning, my name is Adam Geisler and I'm a citizen and enrolled member of the La Jolla Band of Lasenio Indians in uh, Southern California, uh, where I spent nearly a decade as a former elected uh, official uh, for my tribe on my tribe's council before coming over to the federal government to help on broadband issues at the First Responder Network Authority that many of you may know as FirstNet. Um, in the last few months, I've been pulled over to help uh, NTIA uh, in building out one of the most incredible opportunities that I've ever seen in my career around broadband and infrastructure for Indian country and that, and that opportunity is called the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program, which is nearly a billion dollars that is out and available. The NOFO launched uh, on uh, June 3rd, 
Uh, for those of you that didn't get a chance to check out the event, we actually had Vice President Harris, uh, our Secretary Gina Raimondo for the Department of Commerce, as well as Secretary Holland all provide comments, as well as representation from the, uh, by the Treasurer of NCAI. Um, so it was a really well uh, done announcement. There's a lot of buy-in around the, the opportunities that are out there. Um, in addition to the billion dollars that we have, uh, in the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program, which is that the number one you'll see on the screen there. There's also a couple other pots of money that uh, are part of our enabling uh, legislation, uh, HR 133, which was actually passed back in December uh, and tied to COVID response and COVID relief. Um, the other pots of money, uh, there's a 300 million sitting out there for uh, broadband infrastructure grant programs. Uh, uh, a lot of that is kind of more state centric, but I think in, in, in terms of the discussion that we're going to be having today, um, I know that uh, Jeff, Christine, uh, Governor Ducey, and the team are, are looking at a holistic approach. And I think, again, Vice President Lies, you did a nice job of talking about there being a need for partnership across um, all lands and boundaries when it comes down to the co connectivity issues that so many have faced. Um, in addition to the 300 million, there is another 285 million that, um, that is working its way through the process as well called the uh, Connecting Minority Communities uh, Pilot Program. And this one is, uh, is really focused on um, historically black universities and colleges as well as tribal colleges and universities. Um, so I wanna encourage you to check out our Broadband USA website as a whole and just know that over here at NTIA, which again, we're housed in the Department of Commerce, um, we have those three pots of monies that we're working on right now. Um, and today we're going to talk about the NOFO and the billion dollar release of the, of the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program. Uh, next slide, please. All right, we'll go one more. There we are. So uh, who can apply for the billion dollars? And it's pretty broad. Um, tribal governments are eligible for uh, applying for this pot of funding. In addition to that, tribal organizations, tribal colleges or universities, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, um, on behalf of the Native Hawaiian communities, and then also the Native uh, corporations. So uh, for those of you that were kind of wondering if this, if this was the same parameters as CARES, it's a little different. Um, we have pretty much all the buckets that encompass Alaska, Hawaii, and the lower 48 uh, federally recognized tribes uh, that are eligible, plus um, tribal organizations and governments. So what can you spend the money on? If you're going to turn, turn in an application, there's a few things that you can be considering. Um, and, you know, we'd love to see applications that both focus on infrastructure as well as broadband adoption and deployment. So, you know, we expect to see applications coming in from you regarding the expansion of broadband adoption and deployment on tribal lands. And I want to point that out on tribal lands. The goal of this is to connect unserved communities uh, and unserved households and anchor institutions that are that are on tribal lands, as well as to support distance learning, remote work and telehealth. Um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so when is the, uh, is the announcement for the NOFO out? It's out, everybody. If you go to the Broadband USA website uh, and you punch in tribal, you'll actually see the tribal NOFO. Um, in addition to that, uh, Christine, we're happy to send over the link to the NOFO if you wanna share yourself and Jeff through the listserv that you have with the tribes. Um, we're also gonna be working with the Intertribal Council of Arizona to share information as well. Um, with Maria Dadgar and the team over there. Um, so NOFO's out, everybody. Exciting time. Um, so in terms of the eligible entities, uh, I, I want to point everybody, because I know there's a lot of questions that are sitting out there about who's eligible. Um, and I'm going to steer all of you to go, to go pull the act itself, to go pull HR 133, Section 905A8, and check out what we identified in statute. So again, this wasn't uh, uh, this isn't something that we kind of conjured up. It, it's something that has been mandated through statute. So tribal governments, tribal colleges and universities, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, tribal organizations, and the native corporations as defined under ANCSA. Um, so next slide, please. So eligible lands. Um, in addition to the definition of uh, eligible entities, there is in statute, section 905A13, uh, a definition of eligible lands. And so uh, I want you all to take a close look at the language and, and figure out where you fit in these different uh, parameters as you're thinking about your application and your application process. Um, I wanna just share with everybody that we are working on updating an FAQ that should be on our website. I'm hoping by tomorrow uh, at the latest that will hopefully address maybe some of the questions that you have. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, 
per statute, any lands that are located within the boundaries of an Indian reservation, Pueblo, Rancheria, or a former reservation within Oklahoma, uh, any land located within the boundaries of an Indian reservation, Pueblo, Rancheria, where the title in which is held in trust by the United States for the benefit of Indian tribes or individuals, um, by an Indian tribe or an individual Indian subject to restrictions against alienation under the laws of the United States. Uh, and uh, the third there is by a dependent Indian community. Additionally, uh, any lands located within a region established pursuant to Section 7A of ANCSA, the, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, um, as well as Hawaiian homelands as defined under Section 801 of NAHASDA, the Native American uh, Housing, oh geez, too many acronyms, Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination uh, Act. And then uh, lastly, those areas or communities designated by the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs uh, or excuse me, the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs of the Department of the Interior that are near, adjacent, or contiguous to reservations where financial assistance and social service programs are provided to Indians because of their status as Indians. So there's a lot there, and I really want you guys to spend some time looking at that. If there's some questionable components about that, we're going to encourage you to demonstrate where you believe you fit within those parameters. Um, so again, we have an FAQ that should be coming out. I, I'm, I'm assuming there are questions in this space, um, and I am going to steer you to the FAQ as we move, move along, but uh, those are the eligible lands. Some key requirements of the Act in terms of timelines. So there's 180 days uh, from the award for grant to commit funds. So uh, there, from when the award is made, 180 days to commit, draw those things down. Um, we, gotta get, we wanna get those monies out the door. Uh, more importantly, and I think this is, uh, we, we already know that there's questions about the, uh, the elements related to the non-infrastructure. And when I say that, I guess it's, I'm, I'm referring to digital inclusion, telehealth, education, telework projects, essentially all of those things that don't necessarily involve infrastructure deployment. Uh, you have a one-year timeline and that's a firm, hard, fast, strong one year um, uh, from when you receive that award. Uh, in addition to that, there's a one-year completion deadline for infrastructure projects, but I want to highlight this for everybody because this always seems to be a question. With extensions that can be requested, we've heard it, you guys, there is lead time on accessing fiber, there are things that are just outside of the control in, in general planning. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a former tribal leader, there are plenty of projects that I touched that were on an 18-month time schedule. We realize that that may not uh, fit what you're thinking right now. But I want to point out to everybody that there is a potential, uh, there, excuse me, there is a process to request an extension, and we'll go through those parameters in a minute. So if you're thinking about a project and you know it's going to exceed the timeline, don't, don't be scared. Um, move forward and let's have that conversation. Additionally, uh, with regards to indirect cost rates, um, I know many of your tribes out there have large indirect, indirect cost rates. It's the nature of, of many uh, of, of tribes across Indian country. 20%, 30%, I've even seen 40% indirect cost rates, IDCs. Um, for this program, you are not uh, permitted to go beyond 2% uh, in terms of, and that's in statute. So again, this isn't something that we conjured up. That's something that's a requirement within statute. So only 2% is allowed for eligible entities' administrative expenses. So what does that mean? Look at how you can write those things in as direct expenses. I'm assuming you're gonna be thinking about big projects, um, with long time frames. So think about how those may be considered as direct costs and writing those into your applications. Uh, eligible entities receiving awards for new construction and broadband infrastructure must prioritize projects deploying uh, the infrastructure to unserved households. Unserved for this program means a download speed of 25 megabits and an upload speed of three megabits. You'll hear the term thrown around 25.3. I'm going to simplify that for everybody and say, if you can't uh, edit documents uh, jointly online, or you can't get on a virtual event like this and share your audio and share your video, then you probably don't have 25.3. Um, and there's some parameters within the program, within the NOFO, that uh, really do promote tribal uh, self-certification of, uh, of what you have in terms of speed and coverage. So I want to make sure you know, again, this will be in the FAQ, it's in the NOFO, but I did want to highlight that for everybody, that there's a strong component in here about self-certification of uh, data speeds as well. So I just wanted to raise that for your awareness. 
Next slide. So clarification on the extensions. Um, there's essentially three components here that we're talking about when we're looking at uh, eligible uh, eligibility for extension. The first one is if you have a plan uh, to use the grant funds, but you're just up against the realities that I know many of you are, lead time for um, uh, items that you've ordered, right? Fiber is on a back order for months beyond, and so it takes you over the timeline. Um, we realize that, that that's a reality that you're dealing with. And so at the end of the day, if you have a reasonable plan, we want to talk to you about that extension needs. So don't, don't be intimidated. Uh, second, if your project's under construction, we want to make sure that that comes to fruition. Um, and so obviously, we're going to take a hard look at extending projects that are under construction. Um, the goal here is to get to yes where we can and to get those services to those unserved areas of Indian country, and that's the goal. Uh, lastly, um, it does also include essentially force majeure, extenuating circumstances that require an extension of time to allow the project to be completed. God forbid COVID 2021 happens or could happen. It, you know, if that's the case, guys, if it's all out of our control, we're obviously going to be flexible because shutdowns may happen, other things may happen, and we realize that those are, are circumstances that are real, um, especially given what we've all experienced in the last year and change. Again, I want to highlight this. Extensions for the non-infrastructure components um, will not be provided. So broadband use and adoption projects, non-infrastructure, we will not do extensions. It's a one-year hard, firm timeline. Uh, next slide. Next slide. All right, so this is exciting. No match. Um, I'm really, really excited to be able to say that after going through uh, three days and 13 hours of consultation, hearing from tribes across this nation, including tribes that are on the call today, I want to point this out, you guys. There is no match required. We heard you loud and clear. We realize that many of you are trying to get your economies back and going. You're still dealing with the ramifications of the pandemic, and there's financial constraints. So no match. Happy to say it. Very proud to say it. Uh, so there we are. Next slide, please. All right, so this is a this is an important piece that I did want to want to put out there. Um, we have a uh, a couple different processes that we go through in reviewing the applications as they come in, and one of those is a merit process. Um, and essentially, uh, for those of you that hear review technology merit, and you're kind of wondering what that means, the merit review process is essentially where we're just making sure that the applications are complete and that they have the components that they need to move forward into the next round of review. Um, and so uh, we are going to beg, plead, and ask that for those of you that have an interest to volunteer your time, that we would love to have you participate in the merit review process. Questions that usually come up. What about conflicts of interest? We will make sure that you're not reviewing your, your own tribe's application, obviously. Um, uh, but moreover, uh, we're, we're going to make sure that um, as we approach and get into the merit review process that we are addressing any of those conflict issues. So if you're the grant writer, maybe you aren't the person that probably should be doing or volunteering for a merit review, but I know a number of you have large tribes, have um, large amounts of staff. Maybe there's people within your, within your tribal organization or government that could help in the merit review. The other thing that I'm going to say about the merit review, sorry to, 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 to drag this on a little bit, but it's important. We know you all want to get access to these funds and we want to get them out to you. But here's the reality. We can only process the applications based on how many people we have and hands we have and eyes we have to review this. So the faster and more merit reviewers we can get online, the faster and more likely it is that we will hit those timelines for getting the dollars out the door um, and getting them into your, into your accounts to get moving on these projects. So I'm going to beg, plead, ask. Uh, for your assistance with grant review, you see it right there. Uh, grant reviewers at a reviewer at ntia.gov. Send your name, your residence, your email, uh, your employer, uh, position, and years of experience. Don't be intimidated if you don't have a ton of experience, even if this is new to you. We train, that's okay. So there we go. I covered the merit review. We'd love to have your help to help get these dollars out faster. Uh, next slide. All right. So I know that a lot of you are going, Adam, where's, where's all the meat? There's probably more uh, that we need to go over. And, and, uh, and I know that I'm, I'm sure some of you are hoping we'd be able to go through every single component of the NOFO today. Um, uh, and actually, we are holding off on that a little bit only because we are, frankly, going through the approval process of our slides. And we're geared up to provide that type of a walkthrough of the NOFO on June 16th and 17th. 
uh, it's the same show. So if you don't make the 16th and you come on the 17th, I just want you to be aware that the Travel Broadband Connectivity Program content for the June series is going to be uh, the same content. So if you can't make one day, jump on the other. Uh, so I really want to promote that, encourage you guys to participate. Also, if you want to find out more about the other programs, the Connecting Minority Communities or the Broadband Infrastructure Program, those other two pots of money, we have a webinar series there as well. You can find out more information and register um, for the webinars uh, at the Broadband USA NTIA website. You'll see that at the bottom there, the hyperlink. Um, register now. Uh, we anticipate getting close to hitting that ceiling. We've come close to that a few times. Um, so a thousand sounds like a lot, but when you think about how broad the applications are um, and eligibility, we have seen, um, we, we're hitting, getting close to those thresholds. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So now for the fun part, uh, in the hot chair. So uh, Christine, we're at a point now where um, we can go ahead and do a little bit of Q&A and maybe the, the best way to approach this is to go through and punch those questions in in the chat, um, if that would be okay. So we have, uh, Christine, you wanna go ahead and kind of go through the questions and we can try to answer those as we go? Sure, um, we've been receiving a lot of questions about the slide deck on how these are going to be shared and when they'll be available. Great question. So now that the presentation is done, um, all these slides have been vetted. So you're, you're feel free to share that with the listserv, Christine. Uh, not a problem on our end. Great. The next one is from John Molina. John Molina says, there are many more natives living in urban areas, many in zip codes that are underserved and experiencing challenging and accessing care any funding opportunities for urban Indian organizations and or clinics? So I would take a strong look at tribal organizations as the definition there. Um, the other thing that I wanna point out is that the process that we're using is grants.gov. And in order to submit an application through grants.gov, you're gonna to have to have a, 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 an EIN and that EIN needs to match the name of the organization. And you also are gonna to need to have a DUNS number. So uh, tribal organizations are eligible, tribal uh, consortiums essentially. Um, so, but keep in mind that uh, somebody would need to take the lead and you're gonna need to have those components in place in order to submit. Okay. Um, can tribes request for a presentation locally? You can, um, but I'm just gonna be straight. Uh, this, there's a 90 day window Right, so the application and the timeline started June 3rd. It closes September 1st. So there's a 90 day window and there's uh, not as robust and large of a team as we'd like. So the more we can regionalize technical assistance, um, we wanna leverage that. That is one of the asks that we have is to convene either in working with you, Christine, setting up a couple of reoccurring technical assistance uh, meetings within the state, um, or also leveraging the Intertribal Council of Arizona as a potential body mainly to convene uh, those of you that are in Arizona to have those conversations. So you can send the requests, but if I'm just being candid with you, we're really gonna try to regionalize the approach. Some of you are also probably wondering, Adam, I don't want other tribes knowing my business. Uh, I guess what I would say to that is, and I don't blame you, um, but what I would say to that is, this program isn't a competitive program. It's based on need. Um, and where there's opportunity for collaboration and coordination, we're really trying to promote that. And so uh, your tribe's needs may be very different than another tribe's. And maybe there's some ideas that are out there that make sense that you haven't thought of. So um, while I realize that some of you may have some specialized requests, we'll try to meet those. But just know, again, we're really going to try to work through the regional approach based on timeline and resources. Uh, so we'll do our best to meet that. But that's the honest truth. Okay, great. This next one is from Timothy Nelson. How would this address the need for a tribe to own or set up their own system? The current situation is that there is an outside provider at this time. Um, I would say that uh, you, need to, you need to look at what's best for your tribe. Uh, if you, and, and it comes back to that uh, 25 down three up speed and whether or not that access is there today. And so uh, I've heard tribes talking about wanting to get into become their own internet service provider. Um, we're we, we're going to encourage you to go after the solutions that make the most sense for you. And I think that's the beauty of the way that the NOFO has been constructed. The team has 
has worked, frankly, across federal uh, with federal partners to really get it to that point. The idea of this program is to meet you where you're at. If you want to do feasibility studies and that's where you're at right now, go for it. If you want to do feasibility studies and engineering and infrastructure, go for it. If you want to do infrastructure and uh, workforce development or digital inclusion, like non-infrastructure items, all that can go into the application. So uh, Mr. Nelson, what I would say, I think it was Mr. Nelson. I hope it was Mr. Nelson. I'm sorry if I'm wrong. Um, uh, I would encourage you to take a hard look at what makes sense for your tribe, figure out that plan. We're going to have some great panelists here in a moment that I think will also shed some light on some of their approaches and really look at uh, what makes sense for your community. So it's a horrible Fed answer, and I'm going to apologize for saying it that way, but that's the honest to God truth. We, we want you to solve the issues that make sense in a way that makes sense for you. This is really tribally driven. Okay, the next question is from Hazen Kaur. Is the 1 billion from tribal connectivity grants separate above and beyond any of the CARES and COVID relief packages? Um, the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program is a separate pot of money identified in HR 133, section 905. So, um, and I apologize because that, that's kind of a broad question. So it is part of a broader COVID relief response uh, uh, legislation, but it is its own standalone separate $1 billion. So we know there's money over at Treasury that's out there. We know there's money over at USDA. We know there's money over at FCC. We know there's money over at EDA. This is a separate pot of money than that. It's its, its own $1 billion um, identified in statute. Okay. Next question is from Mikhail Sundust. What if tribes have a desire to develop broadband infrastructure and programs, but currently lack the capacity to do a full build out? Building that capacity can take a long time. This is tough. Um, I would encourage you to, to take the biggest bite out of the apple that you can. Um, if you know that you wanna to get to a point where you're deploying your own infrastructure uh, I would look to partners that are out there. And obviously, as the government, we can't, um, we're not allowed to recommend organizations, consultants, companies. But you know what I am going to recommend? Um, you have an amazing team within the state of Arizona with, uh, with uh, Jeff and with Christine. I would pick their brains about who they may have or who they could, how they may be able to provide some technical assistance where your tribe may be lacking. Um, I would also have a conversation with some of the other tribal consortiums that are out there and pick their brains as well. There's a lot of people talking about this and figuring out partnerships. Um, and so that's the direction I would steer you uh, in. Horrible answer. I know it's probably not what you wanted to hear, but that's that's the best I can do for you today. Um, and on that note, I want to emphasize that the panel that we have coming up is there are different stages of development. So some are very advanced and some are not, but this would be a good opportunity to glean what they have to share because it may be a project where you start small and grow over time. Um, and speaking beyond what may be available after this year, it's going to be unknown. So the point is to make sure that you have this information right now and share with your associates because this isn't going to be the last presentation or the last conversation that we're going to have um, in around this context. It's just the beginning to a very long series of dialogues. And I, we had been talking about setting up an advisory committee so that we are able to better address those tribes that are not as advanced as others. Let me see. Okay, next question. Yeah, we did a lot of interest in persons who are interested in receiving copies of their presentations in slide deck. And there's currently standing in the queue. Yeah, uh, again, uh, Christine, now that we're, we're through the presentation, feel free to share to the listserv and we're, we're happy to have that shared. Oh, great, and that's going to be perfect because I think after our attendees hear from some of our panelists, they're going to have a lot more questions. So why don't we just move on and take our five minute stretch break now, and then we'll take five minutes and come back and proceed with our panel. Sounds great. Again, Christine, I wanna thank you and the governor for the opportunity, Jeff and team, and thank you to all the tribal leaders and, uh, and 
members of the tribes that are helping on this issue. Um, we're here to help how we can. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to share.
Hello and welcome back everyone. So now we're going to go to our Tribal Broadband Solutions panel. In today's moderator, we are happy and honored to have Gabriel Montoya join us today. Hello, Gabriel. Gabriel's the Broadband Program Specialist at NTIA. Gabriel, would you like to introduce yourself or say a few words before we get started? Definitely, thank you, Christy. Uh, Good afternoon, my, or it's afternoon there. Uh, my name is Gabriel Montoya. I am uh, an enrolled member of the Pueblo Powake in Northern New Mexico. I am uh, recently uh, part of the new uh, tribal broadband team here at NTIA. Uh, I come with uh, 27 years of experience working in tribal government. Uh, I have served on council for many of those years. Uh, I've also helped oversee um, a middle mile network in Northern New Mexico that stretches across uh, three counties, four tribes and a city. So it's been interesting to ensure that that, that a connection gets across. So thank you for having us here, Christine. I know that we have a great number of uh, professionals from Arizona who are showing some great promise of what's gonna happen in, in Arizona. So at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce Nicole Umayan. Uh, she's with, uh, maybe I'll let you explain yourself a little more of what your job title is in that, so I don't butcher it, if that's okay, Nicole. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, hi, Gabe. Nice to see you again. Um, it's really an honor to be here um, to learn and to share some information about some of the great digital inclusion projects that are going on in Arizona and the Southwest. So my name is Nicole Umayam, and I'm the Digital Inclusion Library Consultant with the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records. We are a division of the Arizona Secretary of State. Um, in my department, library development, we support libraries throughout Arizona. So this includes school libraries, tribal libraries, academic libraries, uh, all sizes of public libraries in um, providing the best customer service that they can. And at the State Library, we recognize that Digital access, broadband access is fundamental to providing library services in the 21st century. Um, we provide services through grants consulting, through training for library staff, and through um, collaborative programming in a lot of ways. So you've heard earlier this morning um, some talks about digital inclusion, and I really wanted to clarify what we mean when we're talking about digital inclusion. So first, um, digital equity is the broad goal. So digital equity is the social condition where everybody has access to uh, information and communication technologies. And then digital inclusion are the strategic steps and components that are taken to achieve digital equity. So typically we refer to this as the three-legged stool, which involves internet access, uh, digital skills to use the internet, as well as the devices to be able to get online and meet your needs. A cell phone alone isn't really going to be a sufficient device for doing things like filling out a job application, uh, writing an essay, or doing a lot of um, research um, or um, telehealth services as well. Um, Gabe, I don't know if you want me to stop there before we get into yeah. some more projects. Yeah, why, why don't you, um, can you explain a little bit about what kind of equipment you're currently using within the digital inclusion? Kind of give tribes an idea of what's a possibility and what can be out there and what should tribes be looking at to be able to, to provide for their communities? Sure, so some projects that I love to highlight, at least that are um, coming from libraries, are device lending and Wi-Fi hotspot lending programs. And these are where um, libraries can check out devices to individuals to meet those needs. So we know from data that um, a lot of people who don't have broadband internet access are relying on smartphones for their access alone. And in order to really um, take full advantage of, um, of the internet and what it has to offer, we want to have a, a keyboard, you know, a full keyboard, a large enough screen, um, as well as uh, new enough equipment to be able to uh, get on, um, you know, meet the current requirements for different websites. So sometimes outdated computers just aren't equipped to um, uh, Get, get online in that same way. So there's some programs that um, we've supported through the state library to let libraries begin these sort of lending programs. 
One of my favorites is the Akchin Indian Community Libraries, uh, Higher Ed on the Go, where they checked out Wi-Fi hotspots and laptops to college age students that did not have internet access at home so that they're able to continue their distance learning without broadband access at home. We have other libraries that emphasize um, job seekers as well. So they will reserve devices just for people who are looking at our online databases for jobs online. They're um, checking out printers sometimes as um, we still require some paper documents in some of those applications um, all together in a package. So it's not just the internet without a device. It's not just a computer without home internet, but really making sure that that entire process is, um, is uh, taken care of and that people have those have those needs. Um, this was all going on before the pandemic, before those public computer labs were closed, um, but it continues to be a problem. So, so with all this outreach and, and digital inclusion equipment you're putting out there, is Arizona looking at anything with um, language preservation or anything to that matter that we can, those, those equipment can be used to preserve the, the cultural identity of the tribes? Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because when we think about public libraries, you know, we might think about, well, this is the fastest internet in town. We might think about those computer labs. And of course, we think about books. But um, tribal libraries in particular are also cultural hubs in their communities. And that's because of the expertise of those library staff, as well as the people who are coming there to learn the skills to be able to engage with this information to be able to not only digitally preserve, but also promote language and cultural materials. Um, in the summer of 2019, oh, if we can remember back to those days, um, we collaborated on a very uh, exciting project with the Hopi Public Library that we called Digitization Week. And this is actually where we took the mobile lab to different villages on the nation, and were able to bring in community members to scan and digitize their important documents, audio recordings, uh, photographs, CIBs, um, you know, whatever they had. And because it was a library service with those trained library staff members, we were able to provide, you know, one-on-one -on -one trusted support uh, for building the digital skills and confidence to use that technology. Because for some people it can be a little bit intimidating to say, okay, now I have to scan this document and you know, what is a flash drive? And, and you know, wh what am I going to do with all these things? It's all of those components that libraries are really great at doing. Um, after that program, um, we were able to put together a series of um, digitization kits that I was able to distribute to a number of tribal libraries here in Arizona. And those included, uh, materials or uh, equipment for digitizing uh, cassette tapes, you know, there, there's still some of those out there that we want to get preserved, um, as well as uh, flatbed scanners, uh, document cases to preserve those physical items. And so that way people can go to the library to use that equipment as well as get the assistance for, um, for learning how, how to use the equipment. And I'm glad you, you mentioned um, training because I understand the library there, you've been training a lot of your librarians to, to become the subject matter experts. So while they're out in the field, they can help your, your patrons when they come in to ensure that. Can you tell us a little bit about your training program? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, um, you know, my department at the State Library, we kind of consider ourselves to be the helpers helpers, right? The librarians are the ones on the ground who are uh, interfacing with the public but they also need some support and professional development training to be able to be experts on, on broadband and uh, technology as well. So we approach this in a couple of different ways. Um, sometimes it looks like broadband 101 training for those library staff members. And so that's so they're really understanding the um, technology and infrastructure that's coming into the library and how to um, analyze and speak about um, those services to tribal leaders so that they can really advocate for um, increased support and services. So that's things like understanding how to count Wi-Fi sessions, understanding the difference between a T1 line and fiber infrastructure coming into the building, as well as things like how to manage um, public computer networks and make sure that they're making the right safety and privacy decisions. So we do a lot of um, that type of one-on-one -on -one consulting with, um, with library staff. Um, in addition, we also um, help those helpers to provide services to, uh, to their community members. 
whether that's training on different databases that we have. And those are things like ancestrylibrary.com, where you can do a lot of uh, genealogy research. Um, but it tends to be pretty popular with a lot of our communities, as well as uh, job searches or uh, looking up different grants that are available and uh, demographic information, uh, reading lists, um, lots of uh, tutoring support. So all of that involves um, you know, skilled information professional staff that are there um, that have those library service uh, skills and credentials to be able to share back out um, you know, as these great information professionals. Thank you. And, and I know we're going to be running close on time. This is a lot of great information, but one of the subjects I was hoping we can touch on a little bit was the E-rate program and how that affects the libraries and what does that mean for tribal libraries or tribal nations for that matter, if you could share a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So E-rate is the Schools and Libraries Universal Service Support Program, and this is administered by the Universal Service Administrative Company uh, under the FCC. So essentially, it's a reimbursement program that allows schools school districts and libraries to get funding for broadband infrastructure coming to the building, as well as all of the internal connections, um, uh, routers, wiring, um, and maintenance of those networks. Um, in fiscal year 2020, um, Arizona libraries um, applied for a combined total of uh, $9.6 million in reimbursement for our fiber buildouts for um, updating these networks and, and so forth. Um, a really great example that you can um, check out is actually led by the Santa Fe Indian School. Um, and that was a consortium of a number of different New Mexico Pueblo uh, libraries and schools working with their IT departments, working with tribal governments, working with their state library to um, put out a social bid to actually build their own fiber network through, um, throughout the area. So it's a wildly successful um, example. Um, Vice President Leiser also mentioned um, wiring up chapter houses by um, getting them rec recognized as E-rate eligible community center hubs where there aren't, might not be enough public libraries or schools that are meeting those people's needs. So that's a great example of a partnership with the state library, with the nation, um, with libraries on the ground, um, thinking through this problem of how are we going to make sure these anchor institutions have access to affordable broadband service that we know is already life-saving and critical for people. Well, you know, E-Rate is a very, um, a very nice program when you're looking at building out to tribes. E-Rate limits um, to the anchor institutions like the libraries and the schools will pay for that. But understand that construction is about, what, 80% of your build-out costs? Those are the times that you should be looking at maybe the tribes putting in a little extra money to overbuild to ensure that those other buildings, the connectivity to the to those areas to to do the telework, to do the telehealth, like uh, Vice President Leiser was, was saying that their, their goals are, you know, those are those are good ways of leveraging for your projects to go longer. So um, have you guys looked at anything like that or is that in the plans to start planning at looking at over those communities? Yes, well, it, um, you know, that's one of the great parts about this program is that it does have an eye towards sustainability in the long term, right? It's, it's a reimbursement program, but if you are um, thinking about, well, what do we actually want our networks to be 10 years down the line versus just next year, then you can make some decisions about what's most cost effective, but what's also future facing as well. Well, awesome. I appreciate your time. I, I, I do uh, appreciate the work you're doing in Arizona especially in the Southwest and uh, wish you luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to um, introduce Belinda Nelson. Many of you know her as one of the champions from Gila River. Uh, she accomplished a lot within the little time that she's been there. Um, she's a young lady uh, pushing things along. So. Um, I, I know Belinda, you you have uh, you have some slides for us, but before we go into the slides, if I could just ask you um, a little bit, or let's do the slides and then we'll pop in with the questions if that's okay. I unmute myself here. Good morning, Gabriel, and good morning to everyone uh, on this webinar and. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, present information on what we're doing 
uh, at our organization. I do want to uh, thank the Arizona Commerce Authority for uh, this event and the opportunity to share. And so, you know, as was stated earlier, these are exciting times and there are opportunities with the resources that are now available. And I, I just want to, in my presentation today, talk about Alluvion Communications, which is a subsidiary of Gila River Telecommunications or GRTI as it's known. Uh, can we have the next slide? And I'd like to uh, give an overview of GRTI and our history. Uh, we were created in 1988 as a tribal corporation and we were, our mission was to provide plain old telephone service. I, I can't help get away from those acronyms. Of telephone service. But GRTI is governed by a five member board and we are appointed by our community council. Uh, our CEO is Mr. Jim Myers and he is the one who oversees the daily operations and has the teamwork uh, to make our dreams work. Since the creation of the regulated phone company 33 years ago, the organization has evolved and today we have five subsidiaries. We have Graham, which serves as a holding company. We have Alluvion Communications uh, serving on and off the community. We have Native Technology Solutions, which is a low voltage uh, company providing structured cabling, security systems, installation of fiber optic networks. And we just recently added a construction company to NTS or Native Technology Solutions. We have Broad Hill River Broadcast Corporation or GRBC, which is a low power over the air television station. And we have a digital connect initiative, which is our most recent endeavor. And that mission, uh, of the entity is a diversified talent pipeline of individuals trained in telecom and technology fields. And I can speak to that later in the pre presentation if I have time. Next slide, please. Um, Alluvion Communications. Uh, Alluvion is a wholly owned subsidiary of GRTI and it is a CLEC or a competitive local exchange carrier and is registered with the Arizona Corporation Commission. Our philosophy is to own our backyard. We want to own our backyard. We provide services on our community, but Luvion <laughs> is also working to provide fiber optic services to um, the underserved areas around the Gila River Indian community. Alluvion is an internet service provider and provides voice, data, fiber services, both dark and lit. And we also offer cloud-based solutions for businesses. Alluvion is providing service through the E-rate program, which is uh, Nicole just got to talking about through schools in Pinal County cities, such as Maricopa, Stanfield and Casa Grande. Through our fiber network, we uh, provide voice and data or broadband to businesses along our route. Uh, we provide uh, to carriers, um, cellular companies, cable companies, other communication companies that provide services. Uh, we also provide voice and data to residential areas. Alluvion provides the uh, dark fiber to data centers in the Phoenix metro area, metropolitan area. And so in expanding our network, we've strategically selected the location of these data centers and uh, fiber to Cascarande and Coolidge. Can we have the next slide? And if we could just stay on the first picture for a while, um, I want to talk a little bit about serving uh, off the uh, community. Currently, we're deploying fiber to the cities of Cascarande and Coolidge, and there is major commercial development just south of our community, especially in the city of Cascarande. Uh, as I stated earlier, we're providing service in and around our reservation, and these cities are adjacent to our community. Uh, I want to touch on how we've been able to leverage the federal funding that we've applied for and received. Uh, next picture please. Alluvion participated in the Connect America Fund phase two auction and won six census blocks adjacent to the Hill River Indian community. 
Once again, we were strategic in bidding on these particular census blocks. GRTI's fiber backbone through the community can provide connectivity to the adjacent census blocks that were awarded through the auction. And our strategy was to use GRTI's existing fiber backbone. The funding to service providers uh, such as Alluvion subsidizes the cost of building new network infrastructure and performing new network upgrades to uh, provide voice and broadband uh, in service areas where, there, where service is lacking. Currently, Alluvion is working on a reconnect grant to build fiber in underserved areas around the community. And the reconnect program furnishes loans, <clears throat> excuse me, and grants to find funds for the cost of construction and improvement or acquisition of facilities and equipment that is needed to provide broadband. Uh, when I mention strategic planning, ultimately the fiber that uh, Alluvian is installing can be utilized by other tribes if they would like to interconnect with our network. One of Alluvian's goals is to provide other tribes an inexpensive option for, um, for internet and other connectivity for their networks, whether it's a uh, a non-regulated network or ILEC or CLEC. So, you know, there will be opportunities in the future. We are also looking at uh, participating in the uh, NTIA's Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see. The, I, I guess I'd like to pivot and um, uh, give a shout out to the National Tribal Telecommunications Association. Uh, it's a comprised of tribal telecoms across the country, but most of which are within the state of Arizona. Uh, in advocates, that whole group is great advocates for telecommunication on tribal lands. Yes, and in the interest, I'm not gonna name all the participants, but I would just like to acknowledge the Arizona Telcos, which is the Utility Authority, GRTI, Fort Mojave, San Carlos Apache, Battleback, which provides service to Thought River, Pima, Maricopa community, and the Hopi Telecommunications. So Arizona has a large footprint here that is served by tribal telcos. And the association provides a forum to discuss issues that impact uh, telecom services to its members and throughout Indian country. And uh, I like to invite you to visit our website there. It's www.nationaltribaltelecom.org. And on the website, we have our petitions and file comments uh, through our advocacy. So www.nationaltribaltelecom.org. Www and next slide, last but not least, and we're looking to the future. We're gonna continue expanding our network to underserved areas. We're going to work on developing our training initiative, DCI. Um, I also just like to talk real briefly about DCI and uh, it's our latest endeavor to uh, provide training in telecom and technology fields. And within our, our company, we have job vacancies and we post any job vacancies in the community. A few years back, we noticed there were no interested applicants. We weren't receiving applicants for uh, from our community members. So, you know, we ultimately, I guess, came to the conclusion that when we put our job descriptions out, uh, the scope of work there probably, perhaps, seems foreign to uh, people who think they don't have the experience, they don't have the knowledge, I can't do that work, and so they don't bother applying. So that began the, the, the seeds of planning for a, a training uh, initiative. And there needs to be development in the trained workforce ready to take advantage uh, of careers in telecom and technology. So tribes who have their own network will need a trained workforce. Uh, training can be provided to other underserved population within the Phoenix metropolitan area. So there's more to come on that. We're still in the uh, development phase. And in the- I commend you on that, Belinda, because you know, in my region, once we train up a technician, 
everybody picks them up. So it's hard to, to get that skilled workforce to ensure that your network is stable. So um, I think that the viable choice is to train your membership. They, they have the vested interest within your community and the success of, of a business that the tribe owns, that you're gonna be looking at how you get that to move it forward. Um, if, if I may ask a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, so, so you mentioned a lot about strategy and how, how you've been very strategic in, in um, how you're going after your deployments and expanding. You mentioned some cell towers, like are, are, are you using those as revenue? And maybe you could just talk real, real briefly about strategy on the 30,000 30, foot level that maybe tribes can look at when they're planning something to do some sort of deployment. Sure. Uh, so Alluvian uh, provides the fiber backhaul or the fiber to these cell towers. And these towers are, could be anywhere in the metropolitan area, could be in rural parts of uh, Arizona. But uh, we are um, working, uh, uh, providing backhaul to them in our community, in the um, metropolitan area, these carriers, um, do provide services to uh, the, you know their respective areas. So, in our network at GRTI, we we are using communication sites as well to uh, beef up our our network here in the community. I think that's a good plan. You know, I um, I've seen other networks that use those cell towers as as the main revenue source, and they're able to provide lower cost internet to the community. So. Um, I, I think the placement and, and reutilizing your fiber assets is probably one of your largest um, strategies to, to be able to grow in a, in a quick amount of time. Um, you know, I, I had, um, so I'm assuming that Gila River uses a lot of vendors. What, what process do you go about to identify vendors? Because now that money's coming out, as we all know as tribes, uh, we get every vendor who has the next greatest technology. What word of advice would you give tribes that um, for first discussion with the vendor, this is what you should do? Right. And I would uh, advise that uh, tribes, you know, have a map, uh, have a plan, have a listed inventory of your assets, have a uh, knowledge of your industries or revenue generating points. I mean, uh, Vice President Lizer talked about tourism. You know, they're in a prime location for tourism. You know, uh, identify your strengths. And then when you talk with these vendors, you talk to them from the standpoint of this is what we want. This is what we need over here. This is what we need here. And and you begin your uh, your discussion for deployment. So. Um, you know, it also helps to have trained uh, employees who taught the language, who know what to ask for and specifically identify uh, what is being offered and what, what, is, what is needed. So uh, pretty much it's, it's just a matter of experience. Thank you, Belinda. We appreciate all your points. Uh, good luck to you in your future endeavors, and I appreciate you being part of our panel. Um, at this thank you. Point, yeah, thank you, Noah. At this point, I'd like to uh, introduce Chris uh, Begay, my Vicente, I'm sorry, Chris Vicente uh, with the Navajo Nation. And if you could introduce yourself and what you do for the Navajo Nation, sir. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, wherever everyone's coming from. My name is Christopher Vicente, Executive Director for the Navajo Nation Telecommunications Regulatory Commission. Um, what our office does is ultimately just regulate any and all telecommunications throughout the Navajo Nation. And one of the, the well, three of the, th three of the words that I live by with, within our code is to promote and expand telecommunications throughout the entire Navajo Nation. So uh, definitely excited to be here and thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out for the ACA for the invitation and uh, NTIA for kind of getting all this orchestrated. So thank you, Gabriel. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, Arizona is doing wonderful things for you guys there. This is this is a great venue to share information. Um, Chris, I, I know um, 2.5 has been like the 
the big discussion around the area. I know Havasupai has really dipped in and did some amazing things, but also understand Navajo Nation has as well. Do you, do, are you able to share any of what you're currently doing with 2.5 and how you're getting those connections out to rural Navajo Nation? Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Gabriel. So 2.5 has definitely been a hot topic, at least for the past two year and a half, because FCC has been promoting it and trying to find ways and creative solutions to close the digital divide for communities, especially tribal communities across, across the country. So uh, just recently, a, a majority of the uh, tribes that have applied for the 2.5 gigahertz have been awarded. And those like us, for example, one of the challenges we're facing, and that's quite unique to us, is uh, some of the territories within Navajo Nation are checkerboard. So we're currently working with FCC with, uh, to try and identify a possible one, 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 um, one drawing, one, one line around the Navajo Nation, at least the main body of it. Because if we, if we can't, you can't engineer a wireless network. So as far as those challenges, that's definitely, that's one of the challenges that have definitely come up with the 2.5. Um, as far as utilizing the 2.5, last year, Navajo Nation uh, applied for the special temporary authority with the FCC because during the, the beginning of the pandemic in February, we we're trying to find creative solutions to try and address and uh, at least get students through the finish line for the spring semester at the beginning of 20, 2020. So, of course, one of the things that was high in, on the priority of the minds of leadership is, again, internet access. We understand that the uh, internet access is a challenge, especially with the limited infrastructure. So the STA was ultimately awarded to uh, our two col our college and our university on the Navajo Nation. So uh, our Navajo Technical University, as well as the Nay College, were able to utilize this to get their college students connected. One of the other things that we also, uh, that eventually down the road, is started to allow um, work with service providers to see how they can implement the 2.5 gigahertz network across the Navajo Nation. Because one of the biggest challenges we're also facing with the with the so many different types of land statuses we have is if we can find a, wire, uh, a wireless solution to provide internet to the home, 2.5 is definitely a way to go about it because the the amount of bandwidth, the, pi the pipe, if you will, can definitely exceed 25 down, three up, which is the definition of broadband. So as far as the creative solutions, that's what we've employed and kind of gave it, giving everyone a heads up on where we're at, considering the uniqueness around Navajo Nation with the checkerboard. So I hope that gives you some insight about what we've been doing. Yeah, that, that's extremely helpful. I think one of the benefits of 2.5, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it allows you to go through different treed areas and and things that normally point to points don't. Is that your experience as well? So as far as the uh, performance with the 2.5, from our understanding, it's it's able to propagate up to 50 miles in, in one single direction. However, of course, keep it in mind, uh, as a water pipe can only provide so much water, you got, got to also keep that in mind about the population density. So, it, and as far as a point-to-point -point network, we, we've heard a couple different... Uh, communities being able to, not within Navajo, but uh, externally, uh, looking at the idea about using the 2.5 as a point-to-point -point network. So with three different channels being available, channel one and channel two providing over 50 megahertz of spectrum, those are ideally uh, kind of geared towards internet access for the home. Channel three offers just over 70 megahertz of spectrum. So that gives you, again, depending on the... Um, depending on how you want to build out a network. And initially, what we're trying to think of as far as a creative solution is, of course, dedicating trying channels one and two for internet access for the home. And then channel three for public safety, because what we wanted to possibly kind of dig into, if you will, is uh, as far as uh, the, the two-way radio network, try and build out a two-way radio network and have the 2.5 be the backbone for the transport for internet access. So that's definitely something that we're looking at as far as a creative solution. So again, it, nothing's officially set in stone. We're definitely looking at creative options from every possible avenue and hearing everyone's ideas on how to utilize all three channels. I really liked your example of, of the water pipe. I use that quite frequently. And, and, and when I make presentations, I say, you know, the main water line is your fiber line and the wireless are the sprinklers. 
So if you figure the droplets are flying to get to the area they can, they have limitations to how far they can get and how much water gets there. And, I, and it's important to understand how to break down this technology for tribal leaders or those who are not really familiar with the area. So, so I'm glad that you're doing that because that's important. And with, with the Vice President Lizer's presentation, you can tell he's very well informed. So congratulations to you. Um, thinking of that emergency network um, looking at law enforcement uh, and, and all of that, that's critical because as we know on some tribal lands, we have dead areas that they can't reach anybody for miles. So uh, good, good luck with that. And I hope that helps, you know, but I, I did have a question. You did mention a little bit about the, the checkerboard land and how that works. What, what are some of the solutions you would recommend to tribes to get across, whether it's fiber, whether it's 2.5, whether it's whatever, how, how do you deal with the checkerboard um, issue when you're trying to deploy networks? Good question. So this is definitely one of the biggest challenges that we often see throughout Navajo Nation. So as far as, again, like the checkerboard, we're just trying to see if FCC will allow Navajo Nation to draw one line around the main body of the Navajo Nation. As far as the wireless delivery, that's one potential opportunity for trying to come up with a solution rather than trying to engineer uh, the, a wireless network to try and work around that area, which again, it seems impossible because if it's checkerboard, you can't exactly just leave that space out, which kind of leads me to the partnerships with uh, the multi-jurisdictional partnerships with your states, your counties, your cities, even oh, it's even up to the chapter levels. Um, currently, I'm here at Three Chapter um, with leadership uh, kind of discussing some of the ARPA projects that may be coming down the pipe. So as far as the um, as far as as far as the creative solutions, if you can, that partnership. One of the one of the things I like to highlight, especially considering that uh, Navajo Tribal Utility Authority was given CARES funding last year to try and expand broadband or expand uh, telecommunications fiber throughout the Navajo Nation in as short as four months. One of the critical things that we needed to do is partner up with Coconino County, the Hopi Tribe the community of Tuba City, because ultimately we were trying to get fiber into the community of Tuba City. None of that would have happened if there was no partnership because it, the fiber was gonna be going through uh, Hopi. So we also had to work with BIA and keep in mind that the expedited time schedule, again, less than four months of getting fiber in there was, it's crazy and unheard of. We've we, the service providers that use CARES funding to do these build outs, they did an amazing job and I can't thank them enough. But one of the biggest things that I can't, I can't stress enough is just making sure that you have that partnership with uh, communities, chapters, counties, and including the states. Because if it wasn't for my, uh, if it wasn't for the outreach, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have known about ACA. One of the other, one of the other examples, again, is as far as the partnership, it's just, um, with, with what Arizona has been pushing. And one of our delegates have been also working with, with leadership in the state of Arizona is uh, Delegate Keelan Begay. He's been pushing for the, uh, the, the smart highways throughout the, Navajo, or throughout the entire state of Arizona. So as far as trying to come up with these creative solutions, it's, it's, it's more than one way to get from A to B. Sometimes you may have to go to A and C and then circle back around the B, but uh, no matter what, don't, don't give up as far as your challenges. One of the other things that um, Navajo Nation leadership, President Nez and Vice President Lizers, they also met with uh, Secretary of Commerce as well as Secretary of Interior. They submitted a white paper to try and see about uh, making some changes to right-of-way processes w throughout the communities across Indian country. So again, these are something that's that's been critical and that that's still moving because the, the amount of time that the cumbersome process with right-of-ways alone is challenging enough. So I don't, I can go, I can go on and on and on about this topic, but I want to stop there. Words of advice, uh, just high level on, on your experience with working with the Bureau or working with who you've had to the counties on, on uh, right-of-way. What, what is the top three things every tribe should be prepared for? In terms of just out of left so, field, but <laughs> yeah, no, no, you caught me off guard. 
<laughs> planning, planning, planning. Location, location, location. If you can, if you can, if the engineers can engineer the route and everyone knows the route, that's definitely top number one thing. Uh, again, number two, making sure that wherever the route's going through, making sure everyone that's a stakeholder in it and that has any kind of um, influence over it, that's going to be number two. And then number three, oh my gosh, just coordination between that there's it's it's that's a challenge in itself and i know that's a really good question i was not prepared for that one. <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's it's that's probably one of the more critical things when you're looking at checkerboard uh my experience has been predominantly building on checkerboard um the majority of our tribal lands uh have um more non-native people living within our boundaries so so it is critical and i think collaboration has been my success uh, in the past because working with the counties, working with the landowners, working with, um, you know, and then across the nation, it changes. You have allotments, you have all these different other components that 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 can get in the way and, and, and limit your progress. That could be a simple day build that turns into a two week build. Uh, th those, those things are important. The partnerships, you can't stress enough. You know, you guys have a great partner in, in Arizona bringing everybody together to say, hey, let's work together. That, that's huge. That's usually half of the battle in most of the states. Um, but Chris, I, I do thank you for everything. If there's one other thing you'd like to share with the group, what would that be? Oh my gosh. Is there anything? I, I, yes, I, I can't, <laughs> I, I seem to cannot stress this enough, but just the collaboration piece is critical. Again, just keep in mind that you may be as far as um, partnerships, you're going to be you could be working with uh, federal departments, you could be working with your states because funding and grant opportunities, there's so many different options. As I heard USDA, so they had the reconnect grant, they have three different types, which is available. You have FCC, which did the rural digital opportunity fund states such as the ACA definitely has some funding opportunities. It, again, Navajo Nation was able to take a uh, part of because two years ago with the forest fire in Flagstaff on the mountain, that literally um, could, that fire comprom almost potentially compromised the tower farm. And that would have, that would have if, if it ran over the tower farm, that microwave connection all the way to page would have been cut. So again, uh, just that partnership is completely critical and just making sure that you're out you're reaching out because uh, one of the other folks that was on here, uh, Nicole, uh, our state librarians, the E-Rate project that Vice President Leiser mentioned earlier wouldn't have been possible without reaching out to e uh, the, the the state librarians. So there's any there's there's people that you'd be talking to that you have that you down the road you're like I'm so happy I talked to you, A and just making sure that network is critical. That's I networking, it, all in itself. I can't stress that enough. And, and so let me ask you a question. Um, you, you know, I think uh, Belinda was saying that that qualified individuals. Are, are, do you struggle with that as well in the Navajo Nation to get qualified employees to help you maintain that your network? So we're in the initial phases, and we actually the um, the Navajo Nation E-Rate Consortium team was kind of created to take on the task of the e-rate build out so there's three individuals with the navajo nation who are permanent employees because i myself and i'm a politically appointed uh, individual so making sure that any of the projects that you do you want to make sure that's sustainable no matter what um but as far as the um we're we're still in the infancy stage right now so as far as the e-rate consortium team they're working in in conjunction with um infinity communications to try and coordinate all this build out because they're starting as early as possibly at the end of this month and beginning of July. So we're, we're still working, we're still working through the details on it, but. And, and sustainability is that, do you look at sustainability fiscally or do you look at it as connection? What does the Navajo Nation look at or both? Me personally, I look at sustainability as five years from now. So not only just the financial aspect of it, but also the, uh, the, the investment piece is the equipment you're investing in, is it future-proofed to, to an extent, if you will. 
Of right. course, we know fiber can handle somewhat a lot of traffic, but as far as like utilizing the 2.5 network, you don't want to max out your capacity. You want to think about possible possible extension down the road. And if not, if you're in communities uh, that are densely populated, what can you do to try and mitigate some of that traffic? So fiber to the homes, what you want to do for densely populated areas. And of course, if there's towers in that community, you want to try and think, okay, there's homes that are further away. So as far as making a cost effective solution to try and get them connected, you want to probably try and do a wireless connection for them. So as far as sustainability, it's, 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 not, it's, a, it's quite a combination of things. So it's just making sure that the project that you're going for isn't going to be just sustain itself for two years. You want to look for the long haul. That's that's what I'm looking at every time I look at any project. You know, I, I want to congratulate you also because I think the Navajo Nation is taking a very good approach in diversifying the different avenues of which you're delivering service, whether it's 2.5 wireless, microwave, fiber, you know, because each technology has its own place uh, and each one has a different solution for the different topography of, of the whole nation. So congratulations to that. And I think that's got to be a bear to manage. So um, I appreciate your time. I, I thank you for everything. Oh, go ahead, sir. One more thing. Actually, the reason why I'm pointing the camera in this direction is this is one of the solutions that CARES funding was actually able to provide. So this temporary mm -hmm. tower here is providing internet access to this community at through. And it's thanks to Sacred Wind and NTUA for Arizona. NTUA is kind of taking care of majority of Arizona. And then you have Sacred Wind that um, was able to get wireless as well as hotspots to these communities during the pandemic. Well, while well, we're still in the pandemic. So they're offering these services for free. So, I mean, that again, that partnership piece comes back into play. Yeah, and I just want to commend you. Every time I see you, you're in a car somewhere else. It's got to be hard <laughs> to to all the different areas, being in the largest reservation in the United States. So um, it, it's nice to see the beautiful scenery wherever you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabriel. Appreciate yeah. it. Have a great day. You too. Thank uh, you, everyone. At this time, I'd like to uh, introduce um, a senior person on the NTI staff, uh, Jean Rice, many of you know her. She has worked in this space for many years. Uh, and I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Jean. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Gabe. Um, what a great panel. And Chris, you know, the ending, and here is something we built <laughs> that has come in just to help out in COVID. I, I was really impressed. Anyway, um, if you'd start the slide deck, that'd be terrific. Um, Anyway, I just wanna say how happy I am to be working on this program that's just dedicated for um, tribal broadband. I mean, it has been a long time coming. I know most of you have been working on it for years. Um, I want to commend the state for their leadership in, in broadband deployment and also in smart cities and their work for us on, with us on this particular project as well on this and other um, webinars. Um, and I also wanted to thank everyone who helped us on the Nation to Nation comments uh, for the NOFA. We really found them very helpful. And I know that took a lot of time and thought, but it really was useful. Um, I'd also like to thank, there was a number of um, organizations like NCI, NTI, NTTA, um, uh, United Southern and Eastern Tribes, and others who um, worked with us and kind of did listening sessions so we could find out what the full needs were within the community. And I think one of the things that was clear as we went through all of it was that tribes are at different levels. You know, some are um, like Gila and Navajo that have really moved forward, um, still have many gaps, but have done a great deal of work. Others are just trying to learn. And so what we were trying to do in the NOFA is to make it as open as possible uh, for people to come in where they're at. So um, if you have 2.5 gigahertz uh, licenses, then that's something you, you could build through this. If you absolutely need telehealth training and education, something can be done through this. If you're having problems with school children getting access, this is something we can work on. Uh, next slide, please. And Adam, I think gave a great job, kind of an overview of, of what our um, projects and, and where they come. But I want to go over kind of some of the eligible projects for infrastructure and also for digital inclusion and workforce training um, and uses. Um, and kind of think about when you're putting your applications for this grant program. Um, the first one is, you know, just what's eligible in infrastructure. One is, is last mile, you know, um, as we noted from the act, you know, the high priority is um, 
final mile, uh, making sure that everyone is served and that no one is left behind in the digital divide. Uh, clearly, we have a billion dollars we're so excited about what the impact it have, but it's not enough. So it's very important that these dollars can be leveraged, say with state dollars or foundation dollars or tribal dollars to try to, 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 to close those gaps. Now, when you think about last mile, not only think about the homes, but think of the, when you design your networks, think about the institutions that might be served. Um, so, and, and look, every place is different. So one might say, hey, I've got my hospital served, but do you have your health centers served? You've got your K through two, K through 12 schools served. What about your Head Start? What about um, your uh, community college? You know, those are the kind of things that you wanna just be sure are built in. Another part is businesses. In your business community, you know, if you have manufacturing, talk to them, see what it is they need and what capacity and see if you can build it into your network. All of your local businesses are worth checking on what their needs are. So I've talked to a couple of um, uh, tribally owned hotels who said to me, hey, if we only had broadband, we might have more business. So, you know, if they have that kind of need, then they'll need, say, extra broadband so that you wouldn't in more uh, higher capacity. So you want to look at when you build your last mile network, think about not just the needs for the home, but the needs for your institutions and businesses. Um, while we were, and also think about, you know, if you're doing fiber, where are your access points? If you're doing, you know, um, uh, wireless, think about, are you building a tower that will meet future needs? So kind of think about now and in the future and how you can kind of uh, use what you're doing through this program to scale um, with other funds that might become available later um, through all the various federal agencies um, that have funding as well. Uh, when we had the um, consultations, it was clear to us that people were telling us that there was a big gap in middle mile, which we have experienced and heard from before. Um, so we're, that is an eligible expense. Um, you know, those of you who are, who are very serious about this, you know how important it is that you have a, a pipeline to a, a point of presence for internet that gives you a robust capacity. So that you know, if, you have a, if you have a tiny pipe, um, for your lat, in the middle mile, you won't be able to have a robust last mile. So middle mile is important. For middle mile, we and, and for other, other components, even last mile, we do recommend that people think about consortiums or regional groups. So for example, in middle mile, if your you know, Pueblos are in a row and you could actually serve everyone as you go by, you know, that would be great to come in an application together because that would um, help as we go forward, um, keep everything cost effective. Uh, next slide. Uh, for those in the, I was just going to admit, cable landing stations are good for the others. And we did find that some people are different places in planning. Some need to do planning themselves. Some have received planning grants but already need to have engineering funds. Some need to update plans, need to develop business plans and sustainability plans. So those are all eligible kinds of planning projects um, within this group, uh, within this funding. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when you think about planning, you know, we really want you to think about scaling uh, for the future. Um, and when you, this kind of insert, insert circle tells you, kind of talk about what we were just talking about, the last mile fed by the middle mile. But think next about what are your kind of applications, the things that really are why tribal leaders are looking at broadband in terms of what they can serve. I mean, you know, um, in, uh, Commerce, you know, we're very concerned about economic development, workforce development, and we find that broadband is a key to having those things happen. Um, but take a look at smart tribal lands. You know, will you be able to do more e-government services so people don't have to drive two or three hours um, to come and get a permit or, or other kinds of uh, things that might be needed? Um, if you have agriculture in the area, you might see what do your farmers need? So, for example, they might say, hey, I want to have less nitrogen going into the ground. How can I sense that? Um, so there are sensors now they could just say where within a field you need to put nitrogen. And, and those kind of sensors have really come down on cost. I mean, Purdue is even doing some now that are um, being uh, uh, done through um, a 3D printer. So there's been a lot of activities. I mean, for example, in the Northwest, people for years have been sensing um, for fisheries. But now there's more data analytics and AI tools that might even make it a better use. So you know, give those some considerations. Um, many of the, many tribes own their own utilities. I think about smart grid applications. And then of course, predominant uses like education and telemedicine, which we'll get into a little bit more later. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what are the things that when people are doing these reviews that we find that people need to really focus on is your business plan. You know, 
what kind of network? I mean, we, we heard um, from Navajo that they use several types of technologies. You know, for in this program, you get to pick your technology and you get to pick your approach. Um, it's really tribal driven and, and, and tribal sovereignty acknowledgement. So it's like, what is based on best for your uh, community and what partnerships work for you. And we've heard um, from our last panel and some great questions from Gabe there um, on partnerships and other best practices to consider. But the business plan one is one to focus on. You need to think about market research, you know, what kind of revenue will be coming in from what sources? You know, will the tribe be contributing? Will you be using universal service funds? Um, will the institutions be participating? Are you gonna offer uh, new services uh, for other people such as uh, safety and other things? So you just have to kind of see where are the revenues gonna come from um, and also what your service offerings are. What do you think would be the most needed? Um, Step four, obviously, is to, to have the funding to complete the environment and cultural reviews because those are, you know, obviously critical. Um, and then taking a look at what are your operational requirements. So let's say you have a utility or a telecom authority. You know, are you going to need an additional truck, or could you use existing trucks? You know, um, if you're doing your uh, operation out of an IT center, who's going to handle billing? Um, those type of piece, and then who's going to do marketing and digital inclusion? The idea is to have all of those built into your business plan and documented through financial performance, which then you can kind of do sensitivity analysis of say, hey, if my construction costs are over five, what happens if my revenue is down 10? What happens? And just kind of give you an idea um, because we want all of these projects in the long run to be sustainable so they can help the communities for the long term. Okay, next slide. Um, we do have some infrastructure best practices. Um, one is asset inventories, that's been discussed already. Um, but think about not only your own, you know, like water towers that could be used for infrastructure. If, if there's conduit that might be on a state roadway that you can take access to, you know, those kind of pieces to look at. Um, I will mention on the federal level, level, the federal government's kind of been moving quickly at trying to get all of their assets available. BIA is making the um, uh, towers for the education network available to be used. Uh, some of those may need uh, some restructuring um, to help them hold the load, but nonetheless, it's something to, to look at. You know, GSA has a website where all their sites are, and of course, the states may have inventories to use. So I, those are kind of uh, key to do. Another is permit process permitting processes um, within, within the tribe. That's something you can work on, as, as you know, within tribal lands. Different lands may have different processes to look at. Um, there's BIA approval. Sometimes you'll see state departments of transportation, cities, counties, utilities. It takes time, and that's something if you're doing these kind of COVID projects, you need to work on right away. Uh, we've talked about the uh, historical, cultural, and reviews, but it's important to look at them and think also about having a review that might have an alternative route if you think you might have a problem with, say, a LATI approvals coming in in time, or if you say, hey, I think we're may, we may not get this uh, tower site approved. So, so think about that when you do it, because, you know, we probably won't have time to go back. So if you can put that alternative in now, go ahead. Um, then the easement analysis. This is also very important on tribal lands. Um, we talked about a lot of approvals, but maybe you can use utility right of way. Maybe there's roadway right of ways. But those are the ones to really pay attention to to get your project going well. The reason we say these work well is because the outcome is generally uh, cost savings and timely construction. So you know, that's kind of what we want to see in this program. Okay, next uh, slide, please. That's kind of the overall kind of what's important in in uh, in infrastructure, just to have you thinking about that. Um, for the inclusion and use projects, you know, this um, has been a really great component because you can do both um, through this program. Um, also, we have really heard from folks that they need, and we heard it today on the panel about how important it is from, uh, from Belinda on the workforce development. So I think that we're very happy to say that we have built that in. So if you want to build workforce development into these projects, whether they're infrastructure or inclusion and use, you can. Um, we have right here um, th this terrific um, grouping, if you go to the next slide, of kind of what we have learned over the time on best practices and inclusion. Um, you know, for access and affordability, it's like no, one size does not fit all. And I think that's the kind of thing to be thinking about. You know, we heard from Nicole about hotspots from the library. There's other ones uh, that you can do like Wi-Fi and buses that has been very successful. But um, 
the idea is to think is where are your gaps, where are your issues, and, and what can this program do to assist? Devices, you know, this is important to think about what devices are needed. For example, um, schools can give out uh, devices if necessary, but from the ACS data, which is a census study that was done uh, that um, NTI works on, there are a need, a great need for devices in, in Indian country. So I think that that's something to think about as you go through these processes. Um, one of the best practices is um, technical support and help is that you have to go where the people are. So in a few places they're doing it in, uh, in firehouses, in some places they will do it in the community center, others might do it at the library, some at the college. Um, it just depends on where your people are most likely to be and to, and to kind of work with their own schedules um, to provide this training. Um, we also find that it's important to do the training not only on just digital skills, but then kind of workforce development. How do you find the jobs and also how do you train for them? Um, next slide, please. Um, I just think that in digital inclusion, there's lots of ways to go, but let me just talk a little bit about let's say you want to do telehealth, you know, because we can, we can uh, pay for devices and we can pay for training. So if you did telehealth, let me give you three possible ways to do it. One, um, you are maybe potentially concerned about uh, mental health in the youth and you want them to take mental health um, advice and, and guidance and counseling. Um, so one of the things they found out from Kansas State was is if you put the kind of booth for uh, mental health discussions um, at the nurse's station, there's not a stigma attached to it. So that's a possible component. Uh, another component is uh, visiting nurses and home care. Um, you can set it up so that they can take their tablets and download via broadband so they don't have to say drive back an hour to three to, um, to be able to have their um, notes, you know, uploaded. Um, we have lots of other um, pieces that they can do. And uh, just another example that I found very helpful is, you know, how can telehealth improve results for people's health, which is kind of the end goal also. Um, and CoBank has a program where they use um, handheld um, phones for diabetes with a, with a uh, computer connection to the hospital and they train people in it. And what they found is that they have better health outcomes and it costs the hospital less. You know, so those are the kind of projects we love to see um, happening go through, uh, through this kind of program. With um, access and affordability, um, we are just um, thinking that there are many choices um, and the mobile hotspots is one I think people have been using. We are hoping for long-term solutions um, as we go forward, because as you know, um, you, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots can be expensive over time, especially if there's a lots of them. So it's great to have uh, more pieces. Um, for the devices, there's lots of programs out there, including refurbished computers that you can use, discount computers um, through different kinds of groups like TechSoup and others, same way with software. So there's a number of ways to get those devices. There's also been a lot of experience. A lot of tribes have had a great deal of experience with digital inclusion programs and workforce training programs. It's worth to reach out to them. I, I love the collaborative um, uh, discussion that you folks had in the last panel, because I do think that is the way to learn and the best way to kind of learn from. And, and obviously in, in Arizona alone, you have just terrific um, broadband champions and leaders um, to work through and work with on this. Um, but, you know, what we do find on help, technical help and support is that youth are very interested in being navigators and helping people with technology because they do catch it quickly. Um, so. You know, if communities are looking at, you know, wanting to involve youth more, then this, you know, might be an area you could kind of work through it on. Um, digital skills training. I mean, that is kind of a super key um, component. And um, you see this through STEM and STEAM training. You see it through workforce development. But say you're doing your own network. Um, the vendors who provide uh, the equipment always come in and train train the staff. Um, maybe you would want to have your technical co your um, tribal college to come in some of their staff to learn too, and maybe we could get extra equipment that can be put in the um, in the community co college or the tribal college that can have so that the students kind of had on network experience while they're trained, and you can keep your ongoing training going. So there's a lot of ideas um, that have worked. You know, there are also kind of like for training sessions, there are um, lots of example um, training curriculum. Um, but of course, you want it all 
dealt with and moved to what your community is interested in. And I, I thought before the, the discussion of the language is important because that, that can be worked through through digital skills training as well. So, um, and for example, let's say you, you know, just pick out some issue that you're concerned about, let's say veteran services. You wanna make sure veterans get services. You know, maybe you think about doing a, um, what you call a, uh, uh, what the national, the rural broadband association has has been already had done, which is kind of in libraries have a place that is a um, a living room for veterans where they can come in and they feel comfortable and they can then get the various services they need through the internet and uh, and otherwise. So, you know, there's a lot of great things out here, and and uh, you have such a great resources with the staff at the state and with your other um, tribal leaders that it's important. Uh, next slide. We have some resources at um, NTIA and next slide after that, that I just kind of run through quickly for you. Um, one is broadband funding. Obviously, you know, you need to think about all these different funding, including USDA, EDA, um, Treasury and others. Um, if you go on this search, um, you'll have it. And also we have a, a place where there's a, uh, the state broadband uh, network is out there by state, and you can find out what state um, grants are available. Of course, I know you, you hear them from Arizona all the time. Okay, next slide. Um, we also are looking at one-stop permitting. The federal government is trying to work on that. I've heard we just got some new uh, input on that, um, but do use this website to help you go through it. On a, on a federal level, we're gonna work really clearly to um, work through permitting on the national level to try to get as much help as we can. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we're gonna have a roadmap uh, that we have there that's a toolkit now. It's kind of based on the BTOP grant information that we all learned as we went through the BTOP grants as well as ongoing experience. Next slide, please. And it's gonna be updated soon. Uh, it'll have a little more on digital inclusion um, and how to structure your roadmap for that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have, one of the things in this grant program is that you'll be able to certify, self-certify where you get, where 25.3 is there. We have a number of uh, resources here that you can use. I do suggest you, whoever's gonna handle this, go to these webinars um, as they um, are very important to um, kind of walk you through how to use them. Next slide. Um, and we just have here, and you'll get this on the slides when you get them, is, you know, kind of all of these different places um, that you have it. I see my time is up. Um, and one last slide I think I've got. And um, resources, digital inclusion resources, and one more. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, these are the toolkit guys. I think these will be really helpful as you go through planning partnerships so you can see what kind of what should go on contracts, what kind of partnerships set up before. Implementation guides, make sure that your plan has those pieces in it and the same way with sustainability, what to think about. So anyway, Jeff, that's just some overview. And uh, I know our team at NTIA is always always open to, to work with you and uh, every, everybody on this group um, as you go forward and, and uh, need it. Just a reminder again about the webinar series. Thanks. Okay, Jeff, I'm gonna turn it back to you. All right, Jean, thank you so much. This was really, really, really important that we, we went through this. and. Uh, NTIA um, has just been a great partner of ours for since I've been here for the last two years, uh, and we're incredibly grateful. Um, wanted to talk about a few things at the state level. Also wanted to give a little shout out to Chris Vicente with, with the uh, tower in the background. Uh, when that all happened, uh, gosh, it was in the middle of the pandemic, uh, they had asked for devices because they were going to be utilizing them. We had sent a bunch of devices up there. And it was amazing how quickly that uh, organization, NTUA Wireless, uh, was able to get that together. So congratulations to, to all our, our, our panelists and speakers. This has been incredibly, incredibly uh, valuable to me as well. Um, at the state level, there were a couple bills that went through our legislature. Uh, one that's actually done and signed by the governor, HB 2596, that opens up the ability uh, for broadband carriers to utilize our highways, uh, our interstates as well. Um, one of the challenges we've had in the past was it was a bit of a gray area. Um, I know that I've had many discussions uh, with um, uh, the Honorable Key Allen Begay and others about, uh, about accessing our highways to, to bring broadband. And, and I think that this is something that we need to look at statewide uh, because it is the clearest path in many ways. Uh, the second bill is HB 2808, uh, and that funds our Rural Broadband Development Grant. Uh, this was something two years ago we were able to give away $3 million 
Uh, and one of the projects, uh, Page, Arizona, went, went up through the Navajo Nation, uh, Bullhead City, and then Payson, Arizona. Um, I want to make sure that everyone understands that as this is passed, my understanding is there's going to be quite a bit more money than $3 million this time around, not to, to, to jinx anything. Um, but we, we would love to partner with our tribal governments on this grant. This is something that, that is in addition to all these great federal programs you've heard about today. Uh, it offers a lot of flexibility in terms of filling in the gaps. Uh, many of our federal grants are very specific in terms of what you can use them for and where you can use them. Uh, we have a little more flexibility at the state level. Uh, along those lines, uh, we are looking for partners. Uh, the NTIA has a $288 million grant, uh, and that is a public-private partnership between uh, the state or a subdivision of the state uh, and, a, and a carrier. Uh, I know we've heard from some great uh, tribal carriers today. We'd love to hear from you uh, if you have some interest. Uh, and now that the, the pandemic restrictions have begun to, to end, I am traveling quite a bit more. I would love to spend time uh, in your community to understand exactly what the issues are and, and to meet with you firsthand. So please do reach out. I'll put my uh, contact information in the chat. Uh, you'll be hearing from me uh, if you do. Uh, and lastly, uh, we do have an announcement to make. We have brought on a consulting firm, KPMG, to assist uh, with some of the broadband planning that we have in terms of the highways and, and the maps and, and, and really trying to, to drill down to a, 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 a model that works statewide with our highways and, and how we're going to do this. We have our first kickoff meeting this week. We're super excited about that. Uh, many tribal leaders will be consulted in this process because you are important partners uh, with the state of Arizona. Um, lastly, I want to mention that we are going to drop a survey into the chat from Shimei. Uh, please feel free to fill that out and, and let us know about what you thought uh, and what we can do better next time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass this off uh, to Christine, who's done an amazing job hosting today, uh, and we're very grateful for her and the governor's office to be involved with this process. Thanks, Jeff. Um, special thanks to everyone who participated today. I know that a lot of information that we shared with you has been by fire hose. So again, I just want to reiterate that this is not going to be the last discussion, but the first of many to come. Um, the state of Arizona is commended to work with all of our tribes. I want to emphasize that this presentation was opened up not just to Arizona, but everyone outside of Arizona who wished to participate. As Jeff was mentioning, some of the legislation that's come in, there's going to be limitations on who can access those funds, and those are going to be limited to entities within Arizona. Um, thank you again so much for joining. If I can, Mr. Leiser, are you still with me? Vice President Leiser? Yes, yes. Sir, could you give us our closing prayer, please? Okay, I can't turn on my video um, if somebody could. Is that okay? Okay. All right, yes, definitely. Okay, thank you, Christine. Appreciate it. Uh, all those on the call. It was great. Robust, a lot of information, very encouraging and uh, very informative. So thank you for everything. But, uh, and all the people in the background that worked on this. So thank you again. Uh, yeah, dear God, we give you thanks. Uh, what a great informative time, just uh, honoring the prayer initially, the uh, asking for wisdom and knowledge. And uh, we also pray for continuing uh, uh, collaboration from all the partners in the, the state, the counties, municipalities, and the regional um, areas, and uh, the tribes, and the, the chapters, and all the little communities that will be a um, uh, benefactor of uh, these should they come to fruition. And again, we submit it to you for just uh, your great work that needs to be done here. We'll work like it depends on us, but pray like it depends on your creator, Dean God. We thank you and give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless everyone on this call and keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mr. Right. Yes, thank you.